Hello and uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Abbas Kazaronian here with the Advanced Resolution Management Podcast and YouTube channel. We are very, very lucky today. We have got none other than Judge Jennifer Togliati and Paul Hare here to discuss COVID and post-COVID uh, ADR. Uh, thanks for being here, guys. Thank My you. My pleasure. Um, okay, so ARM, Advanced Resolution Management, um, pursuant to the governor's orders, did a somewhat of a soft opening where we're beginning to go back towards in-person um, alternative dispute resolution on May 13th. And um, even though, you know, we're doing that pursuant to obviously the governor's orders and the fact that a lot of litigators are still trying to really get in-person meetings with neutrals, the health and safety has to be our top priority at ARM. And, you know, I, I like I personally, as like one of the management, have left it to the absolute discretion of the neutrals whether they want to even partake in in person um, uh, ADR, and of course the parties. And of, we're offering in person and hybrid or still virtual because um, if people want to continue to do virtual, we're open to do that. And so, um, having said that, if people do want to partake in in person ADR, we have some mandatory guidelines that our clients would have to adhere to. So, um, Jennifer, would you like to uh, kind of start about what these protocols are and, you know, Paul, feel free to join in and discuss them and why we think they may be relevant and important. Okay. Well, I think it's important to realize that um, I think, you know, your team did a great job, uh, Abbas, in, in trying to come up with a plan that gives um, an opportunity for all of us to be safe, but that um, also allows for those special cases where maybe maybe you might uh, believe that in-person is, is really crucial for your case. And so I think, you know, you started with the visitors, neutrals, and staff being required to wear masks. Um, I think that's obviously consistent with CDC guidelines and, and appropriate. Um, I think you uh, provide a certain level of comfort when you are going to be taking temperature during check-in with a touchless thermometer. Um, the um, social distancing that the CDC uh, recommends is also uh, appropriate. This office is certainly large enough to accommodate um, social distancing in an in-person mediation where you have quite a few very large rooms that will allow for that. Um, there is um, hand sanitizer and hand washing available um, throughout the day and throughout the mediation. Um, exceptional efforts to make, um, you know, one of the things I've heard repeatedly throughout my mediations on virtual is how much the lawyers miss the lunch. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so I think it's pretty important that, uh, you know, that their lunches will still be um, a consideration of their quality of life while they're here. Uh, but it's going to have to be in a different way. And it's going to have to involve individual uh, lunches that will be provided and not a buffet style. I know there's a few uh, other items that Paul might want to talk about. Yeah, so so we while uh, Judge Tagliati was uh, speaking, I, I, she mentioned something that uh, prompts me to, to just reiterate. Uh, ARM is ideally suited for the social distancing uh, requirements um, uh, that we've uh, that the that the government and uh, our, ourselves have imposed. It's such an open floor plan that it allows us to uh, move around people at the six foot distance. We have various size conference rooms, as was mentioned. And, and I, I believe, Abbas, that we're going to limit our mediations to those that provide the most space so that we can create that distancing. Uh, some of our conference rooms are, are too small uh, to yep. realize that, and so they won't be uh, utilized. However, we'll also continue, and this may be a topic for, for later in our podcast, but uh, continue to use uh, aspects of virtual or remote yeah. uh, uh, video conference uh, mediations. So yeah, we, we have that very large open area, and because that is a central point in the office and a congregating point, we're, we're going to have to be vigilant and, and sort of recognizing we have social distance concerns. So the kitchen area is going to be 
uh, relegated simply to uh, uh, coffee, soda, water like that. And with uh, with our discouraging groups of people congregating, uh, probably even at the six foot distance mark um, uh, in that area so as to avoid uh, any temptation people might have towards uh, uh, going back to a state of normal before we're, we're actually ready for that. Um, and then, of course, handshaking. Um, th this is very, uh, it, it comes very naturally for us, particularly me. Uh, and uh, I have had to learn that, uh, that that's simply not going to be possible in, the, in this age uh, of coronavirus. So uh, uh, there'll be no handshaking at, at arm until further notice, I guess. That's, yeah. that's somewhat counterintuitive to the ADR process, huh? <laughs> it, it is. Yeah, it, it very much is. And so it, it, it presents a new challenge for us neutrals, though, to establish uh, that bond, that rapport, if you will, with something other than a personal uh, bodily contact with somebody. Yeah. Um, I, and, and, you know, and I think the, the only one other thing that I would add to the list that you guys have provided is that we do require a waiver um, for people to enter the building. Um, and, you know, that's like, obviously, to, there is potential liability and we're all lawyers and I think we can understand that. Um, but the remainder of um, the policies that you, you know, you guys went through um, are really for the benefit of everybody, the neutrals and our clients. And so if in-person is something that our clients are looking to do, um, we are still trying to look after everybody's health and safety as a priority uh, above everything else. Um, and so... With that said, um, before we get into how that's going to play out, how have you both found, because I know you've both been very busy in doing some virtual mediations and not, I think you may have even done a virtual arbitration, Paul. Um, I, I have, yes. Uh, how, um, how have you found the virtual experience from the neutrals perspective? Is that question directed to me or? To or? begin with, yes, but I'm going to pass that on to Jen after you, you've answered. So, so you, you and I had a, a before these uh, before the rules went into place that were that we were previously operating under, and I and I expressed to you some some concern that we were going to be able to accomplish what we seek to accomplish at neutral as neutrals in mediation uh, processes uh, in particular, and that is that that rapport that comes from proximity to someone. Uh, and in-person mediations, and I, I had some concerns that uh, that we wouldn't be able to uh, uh, recognize that part of what we do as well. Um, I have uh, come full circle. I have uh, moved 180 degrees. I think it just takes one good experience, um, and maybe a couple of bad ones in that in that good experience to sort of teach us what are the things that we want to avoid and and learn from. I have been pleasantly surprised at how council and the parties have been very, um, they've been very workable. They, 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 they've been very gracious uh, in how we've conducted these, uh, both in terms of arbitrations and mediations. They've been very accommodating. That's the word I was searching for. Uh, recognizing that technical glitches would come up and so forth. Uh, and they have, but they've been sparse in my experience. And um, it's, it's actually been good. I, I've warned some attorneys, uh, Abbas, that not to get too comfortable with this, that, uh, <laughs> that, that uh, <laughs> we're still looking forward to getting back to, to doing these in person. Um, what about you, Jen? Well, I think, um, you know, when we, when we talked about virtual mediations at the beginning, I thought, oh, no, so lawyers will be able to mute me. <laughs> That's not something I want to hear. Um, but it turns out that I think it's worked out remarkably well. Um, again, just as Paul says, occasional, occasionally a client can't figure out what, uh, you know, you'll get a face, but you don't have the sound. You have the sound, but you don't have the face. Uh, right. You know, that's what we have staff here for. Um, it's, I, I mean, three days in a row, I've had a client of a lawyer that had a little bit of trouble with the with the getting the audio up and all it took was a phone call with um a case manager and they were we were up and running in like four minutes so um it's been uh remarkable i think um right. and, and i had the same kind of hesitancy as paul did just because we what we do is so personal right and so um 
you know, on the, you know, this has its own level of personal, uh, you know, you're in somebody's house sometimes. Um, yep. And, you know, you see their, um, you know, kids' pictures in the background. And, you know, I, I once had a, a, a client, a, a, a litigant, we were waiting for the attorney who had to step out and make a phone call. And she had these beautiful plants in her home and she took me on a tour of her house. You know, we had time <laughs> to kill. And, you know, that made it more personal. Um, so I, I think it's worked out really, really well. Um, you know, it's not without some cases that have a little bit of difficulty, but but overall, I'm I am a I am a I've been converted in my view, for sure. So, yeah. Um, um, before we get into the arbitrations, I just want to like you know, I guess one of the reasons as a litigant myself, like you know, when I'm going to a mediation, I really want the adjuster or the decision maker for the other side to be there, because you know when the time comes in the process. You know, I, I, you know, you need the mediator to go in and have that, you know, have that certain conversation, you know, call it a come to Jesus moment or whatever. Um, that, that particular conversation, how, you know, do you think that takes away from that particular, you know, in-person effect um, of doing it over, uh, you know, the Internet, you know, virtually as, you know, when you had that person in the room and, you know, having that conversation with them? Uh, speaking for myself, yeah, I think that, that we did suffer uh, some some connection there with parties. But uh, but I, uh, let me just say that uh, we've made up for some of the deficiencies with some advantages associated with uh, with, with remote uh, mediations. And, and, and Jen alluded to one of them, and that is uh, getting to see people in their natural environment, <laughs> their, their native environment, if you will, and, and using that to establish sort of that uh, affective connection with people using things that are in the background being introduced to, to people's children which i've had the pleasure of of uh, doing uh, a few times uh, but the, the i think there is a, a a genuine awareness that this is what must be i, I had a, a party remind me uh, a member of the united states marine corps uh, improvise adapt and overcome uh, is a uh, it is a uh, statement that's often uh, heard in the in the Marine Corps, and uh, he reminded me of that. And I've reminded myself throughout that we just adapt to the situation. But connecting uh, with principals has not been as much of a problem as I thought it would be. Um, the attorneys are the attorneys, and, and they're of course used to this day in and day out. I, I have found that it's that virtual mediation has truncated sort of my opening comments. Uh, th those tend to get uh, pared down to the to the most important concepts, and and so it's created an efficiency uh, yeah. in my mediations. Interesting. And uh, what about you, Jen? Well, I think um, I think I have found that a majority of the adjusters that I've been working with, I guess, when I log into a room, I'm always relieved to see both video and audio. Yeah. Because the person, the participants, can choose, right? And so, you know, uh, you might think, well, an adjuster, you know, it's not their first rodeo, it's their thousandth rodeo, and they might not feel the need to come in on, on video. Um, but, I mean, facial expressions, body language, all of that has, you know, has meaning. And when you're on video, um, you don't lose that. It's there. Yeah. And so I've been pleasantly surprised that I've only had a, just, I would say, less than a handful that didn't yeah. use the video. And interestingly, the, the one in particular adjuster that I can uh, recall over the last, you know, eight weeks or so, six weeks, um, that doesn't use the video, he has, he's been with me many times. We've worked together many, many times. So I feel like at that point, I can hear him and I know what his face looks like. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in that regard, I've been very, I think we've been, and I don't know if Paul's experience is the same, but I've been very lucky. And I think the adjusters, I've been surprised that they want to be there, video and audio. And even if they click off while I'm not in the room, yeah. I've noticed they'll, I'll come back in the room and they put their video and audio back up. Very cool. And I think yeah. that that makes a difference. It really does. So last week, um, I was taking a virtual deposition and I showed up in my shirt and tie and the defense attorney showed up in his T-shirt. He sees me and then suddenly he goes, oh, hold on a second, runs off and puts on a shirt <laughs> over the T-shirt and comes back. 
So have you been finding, <laughs> so I've got a two-tiered question for you. Have you been finding that these virtual ADR sessions are becoming less formal because people are just not getting dressed up for the occasion? And if so, is that taken away from how serious they're taking the process? Uh, so, so let me just say, I only have one standing requirement. Uh, you have to assure me that you're at least wearing pants. Past that, I don't <laughs> care. Um, I, I've never been bothered by how someone is dressed. Um, I, I think it adds to the decorum, if you will, if you uh, do, do dress up. But I haven't seen any degradation in the seriousness of these and, and the diligence in which people are working towards trying to resolve cases. Um, it, it, it's, it's. Uh, I, I always dress as I'm dressed today um, uh, for my mediations and arbitrations. And um, I, I well, that, that's what, gym, by the way, this is how Paul goes to the gym. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. This is how I go to bed. Uh, we're <laughs> <a> certain time. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you've, com you've caused me to completely lose my turn. I'm, so I'm going to turn it over to Judge Tagliati. <laughs> I'm a bad person. I'm sorry. Totally <laughs> I think, you know, I think, I think this process and, and, you know, again, I'm, I'm, it's refreshing to me to be able to say these things because they're all things I didn't anticipate. I think this process has brought a, a whole new level of, you know, of a personal nature to be able to, you know, joke around with someone, you know, their dog barks or, you know, I, I had a mediation. Uh, it went late into the night, beyond where we thought we, you know, would go. It, it was a, you know, a, a, an 8 p.m. deal, and I remember saying to the adjuster, "Well, now you can toast, you know, you, you know, I'm sure you have a." I joked around and said, "I'm sure you have a bottle of wine in your kitchen," because she was in her kitchen, <laughs> and um, she, she literally, without a beat, pulls up a glass and shows me that she's <laughs> already. Uh, celebrating yeah. and so, uh, you know funny things like that you know you're not going to have the opportunity to do here so it's it's like you know you, you, you the glass is half full pardon the pun um yeah. in, in any time you're doing something different you know people find a way to make the best of it and and i i found that people are pretty respectful of the process you know lawyers want their clients to know they're taking it seriously and they're dressing you know in at least in my experience wearing wearing a clothes, uh, appropriate business attire, at least from the waist up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've had a few of those uh, scenarios. Um, so I think the efficacy of the, of the, of, of, you know, the virtual um, system, it, you know, the, the proof's in the pudding in like how, what kind of results we're getting. And I can talk about the institutional kind of like overall results that we're getting, but I, I, I'm kind of curious, are you finding yourselves that the results, meaning in settlements, um, are, are you are you finding that they you know it's a little bit below the you know the settlement rates that you were getting pre-COVID, or do you think it's about the same, or do you think it's better? I would say this. I would say that in the limited time that we're talking about, I have not seen a significant difference in valuations related to personal injuries. What I have seen is I have seen um, some business matters, um, perhaps um, cases with bigger SIRs, um, and so it's issues of corporate money um, being um, comfortable with a prolonged process. Of course, that makes sense. And um, what about you, Paul? Yeah, I, I echo uh, what Judge Tagliati says about valuations, uh, plaintiff versus defendant. Um, as far as success or settlement rates, I, I haven't seen any any difference. Uh, I will say this, though, that um, I have found that doing these remotely has prompted me to do even more advanced work in the lead up to, to the mediation, reaching out and talking to the lawyers uh, even more than I, I normally do anyway, j just so that I can, again, take advantage of that efficiency, which is sort of driven by the, the virtual process. Um, uh, but uh, but and, and then there, there may be a couple of uh, cases that, that fall in that class where you need a day or two. And this is where my commercial or business related cases come into to play. One most recently, I had international clients 
um, and, and sort of the sensibilities can be different, uh, uh, Europeans versus uh, those located el elsewhere in the world. And, and we had to process those and we couldn't do it on the day of. Those just had to, had to happen uh, over a day or two to solidify the, uh, the agreement. I see. Um, I, I mean, I can tell you as an institution with, with all the neutrals, for, for the, I would say that the first six weeks, we were actually higher on settlement if you took the previous six weeks, um, you know, per capita on, on the number of, you know, if you did an average of settlements in a percentages on, based upon the number we did. Um, and then we had a bit of a dip two weeks ago, and then we're back on the rise again. But now if you look at it over the kind of eight, nine week period, we've been virtual. It's almost identical, which I think is interesting. Um, um, I mean, like variance of one or two points each way. It's either up or down. But I mean, it's a. It, I, I find that fascinating. Um, and you know, one thing we forgot to talk about. Going, I'm skipping a little bit. I want. I want to go back, Paul. Um, how, how how was your arbitration virtual arbitration experience? So that went uh, really well. We had. Uh fairly sophisticated parties. We didn't have any technical issues. Uh, if there were any, they were of my own doing uh, there because, uh, you know, our, our neutrals at arm have different styles and, and methods of doing things. For example, in my mediations, almost invariably, there are no joint caucusing. There's only separate caucusing. Arbitration, of course, connotes a, a joint caucus. And so having everybody in one place and then uh, in one room and then people joining that room from other places when you have you know, plaintiff, defendant, expert witnesses, before and after witnesses and so forth who are joining in the room uh, at different times. Uh, and so there was occasional some interruptions and some delays and so forth. But really, everyone just took it in stride. And it turned out really, really well. And I think I, I, I think it, um, it it prompted the lawyers to be more efficient in their questioning. Yeah. Uh, and it affected the length of their closing arguments as well. Wow. Yeah. And and did they keep a record? Like, did they have a stenographer that was also on? Uh, uh, and, and none of the ones that I've done uh, was that the case. OK. And um, Jen, can you see that translating to like bench trials, for example, um, or evidentiary hearings into the court system? Um, I don't see. Well, first of all, you know, obviously, um, the court rules will control, but I, I think that um, there's nothing that limits. I mean, they were before I took senior status. Um, I was regularly having appearances, uh, audio, and um, I actually had a trial um, with a, a young man who was hospitalized with very, very serious injuries, and he testified from his hospital bed by you know agreement of the parties. So. So, and that was, you know, pre COVID over, over a year ago. So yeah. I think, I think it absolutely will translate. Um, I think that even when, when we get past this dark time um, and we, we hopefully move past it as a country and as a community and as a state, um, there's still going to be people who, who are um, particularly vulnerable that might benefit from from all of this technology that we've had to put into, you know, um, and advance pretty quickly so that we can do we can take care of, of those people too going forward when we get past all of this. Sure. Yeah, one of, one of the things, Abbas, that we and, and uh, Judge Tagliati alluded to it earlier, uh, insurance representative, for example, even before this uh, COVID crisis, we're under strict travel um, uh, restrictions. And uh, now it may even be more so. And now with all the experience and the technology that we have, we can bring those people in, into the room much more comfortably, I, yeah. I think, as everyone has adapted to this. Yeah. And, and, and I, you know, I was going to kind of get into this later, but I think it's, it's a good tra um, transition since, since what you just said. One of the advantages that I, you know, I see in these mediations being virtually is that one of the issues I always had mediating in person is that the adjuster always had to start going to the airport at two o'clock? You know, we just start. I, mean, I barely got a number from you guys. I know you got to go. To the so, so, so now that they're in their house drinking wine, I'm like, you're not going anywhere. Right, right. So, so That's for sure. Uh, so I, I guess, like, that leads me to the question: is like, obviously, 
it's been a horrible time for the country as a whole. And, you know, we, everybody wants to get back to normal. But I think we've learned some important lessons along the way and learned to do things maybe a little bit differently and outside our comfort zones. So what do you think from the virtual process is here to stay um, in a hybrid situation or things we'll continue to use as we move forward um, in the legal community? You know, I think um, I would I would I would reemphasize the the use of this for for particularly vulnerable persons in our population, for maybe you know the cases that Paul's talking about international. I actually before the before the COVID, I had a uh, a Canadian citizen who couldn't travel here on a pretty big case and uh, as a litigant. Um, and so, um, I mean, I think those cases are, you know, probably the things that appear most obvious. I think as we go forward, if we're going to continue to use this um, medium for our work, there's probably, there's, you know, and I've been thinking about it and you and I and, and our neutrals, like Paul will talk about this going forward, I'm sure, uh, but, but trying to to come up with a way to be a little more efficient when we're using interpreters that is yeah. very um that's challenging when you're in person yeah um and so so um but i really think i think anybody that wants to use this technology um can do so and you know maybe if they have a particular client that either needs more in-person contact for whatever reason. Maybe they have some intellectual deficits. Maybe they have, um, they really want to hear um, more from the mediator than a video, video can bring. Um, you know, there can be a million reasons, but, yeah. but otherwise, you know, for a bulk of cases, I think that lawyers might be asking to use this process through the video medium um, yeah. for a long time. Yeah, you, you know, as a neutral abbess, I, I was the one usually the most insistent that parties be present. Yeah, yeah sort of the, the the model. That's that's the best way to affect a resolution is when all the decision makers are are, are in the same place. And, and now I, I recognize that uh, I don't have to be that insistent uh, upon somebody who has restrictions. Um, that I no longer have to fear that somebody's going to be located in Minneapolis and not in Las Vegas if I can make a, a video and audio connection with them. Uh, I've learned a lot through this process, and for that, I'm I'm actually um, you, you know thankful. Not obviously not for the virus, but for the opportunity it's given me to enhance my technological skills and to sort of come off my high horse a little bit about whether parties absolutely have to be present. That will always be my preference, though. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think there's uh, you know uh, we've learned a lot in the things that you kind of laid out, and and I know that you, we're going to have some cynics because there's a flip side to that coin, right? Because if someone doesn't have to travel from Texas or Minnesota or wherever they, they're located to come to Vegas to participate in this, one, there's always, because they have to make that effort, there's always a chance that they're going to settle before the fact. Or if they're going to come, they're going to be more serious about it. And, um, you know, like I, I, it, I, th I think it's, it's, it's going to be a fine line. Um, about that, but I, I think on the whole, being positive about it, I think you guys are right. And for the for the most part, I think you know everybody is beginning to well, not everybody, but most people are beginning to change their attitude towards it. Um, and so, um, what have you found were the biggest hurdles um, of virtual like ADR, and what do you foresee being the main hurdles of in person ADR under the current? restrictions that we have in place? Well, I think that, um, like I, I, I previously mentioned, I have struggled a little bit. I've had, um, I've had several cases with mediate, uh, with, uh, excuse me, interpreters um, that, you know, make the process a little bit more tedious as far as, um, because, you know, the way the video and audio works, you can't really have contemporaneous interpretation, right? You have to have consecutive. Um, and so it, depending on the complexity of the matter and the level of, of dialogue that needs to uh, occur between the litigant and the, and the neutral or the litigant and their client, um, <clears throat> I think that's been a hurdle. That, okay. That's definitely been a hurdle. Um, 
I think that um, the the <clears throat> hurdles that I see for actually coming back to the office under what is you know generally seen as the CDC guidelines and what our governor of our state expects um, and would um, and is recommended for everyone to stay safe. You know, people might not love the idea of wearing a mask. Um, you know, you see that in stores, you see that in, you know, in, in, you know, different areas of our community where some people are comfortable with it and some people aren't. Yeah. And so I think that's, you know, potentially a hurdle, um, not because of their personal preferences, I guess. Sure. Um, Paul? So the, the hurdles to the virtual mediations and arbitrations for that matter are, are basically threefold for me. The first two are, are personal. I don't like seeing myself on camera. Uh, that's, that's one. So that's off-putting to me. Um, the, sec the second thing is I have to be uh, very careful if I choose to do them in my home office where I am right now, I have to be sure that uh, it's reasonably clean. Uh, and at least what's being projected behind me or, or what is behind me is uh, is acceptable. And I haven't left out, you know, McDonald's sacks or something. But um, the, the last one is uh, I, I did experience some some difficulties in, in in what I call papering up the deal um, at the end. Once you've uh, you, you know, you've worked hard throughout the day and uh, normally it's just a putting together a, a memorandum of understanding, uh, some, some, some points of resolution that people are going to sign off on. That has presented some things. Most, of, most of, the, uh, of the lawyers and the parties that I've worked with, when that occurred, they were like, look, we'll memorialize it and CC you on the email uh, our, ourselves. And that generally works. And then there are other instances where I'm like, no, I need to oversee somebody signing right now. I don't want anybody thinking about this overnight or even in the next 20 minutes. Yeah. Uh, so, so I become more proactive uh, in, in that. Uh, as far as uh, reopening the office, I, I agree with uh, Judge Tagliati that this is it, like it's, it's going to be awkward. But yeah, we yeah. improvise, we adapt, and we overcome. And uh, we'll we'll, uh, we'll get through this. We'll be fine. And the neutrals are we're going to do our part. And um, and we hope that everybody will work with us as we work with them to try to keep realizing the same success that we've uh, always realized. Who are? Um, so, <laughs> uh, um, no, finally, before, uh, you know, we uh, call it quits, so I'm really enjoying this particular session. Um, the, uh, um, if anything, do you think that there's anything that litigants can do differently to prepare for virtual or, you know, COVID-19 in-person uh, mediations or um, than they would have, you know, maybe have done, you know, pre-COVID, if that question makes any sense? It, it, it does make sense. That it's a very good question. Uh, I, I'm trying to think how how, how their preparation uh, uh, would be uh, would be different. Uh, I mean, we we've all been proponents of please come prepared. Please have talk to your clients about our process and about you know you know sort of expectations coming in and so forth. Those will always remain um, a special preparation. Uh, I guess it's just preparation for the things like when you show up at arm, they're going to take your temperature. Uh, you need to wear a mask. Uh, please bring one. Uh, yeah. and, and a litany of other uh, precautions that we're taking to keep people safe. Yeah. And um, what about you, Jen? Do you, do you, do you see anything that being different? Um, I, I don't. I think that, um, you know, there are things that we do different. Um, you know, we, I, I, I think I agree with Paul as far as my introduction and my kind of preliminary conversations with litigants has been uh, had to be altered a little bit just so that we could, you know, um, have that time. I, um, I think that um, it's important for the litigants to know and, uh, and, and I've been doing it. Um, it's, you know, it's interesting. You would think that you know, everybody knows Zoom and everybody knows Skype, but I actually had a litigant before I got to it. I have a I have a settlement conference um, spiel, for lack of a better term, that I do to <laughs> give them an understanding of what's going to happen. And before I even got through it, one of the lit litigants said, so is this being recorded? And I mean, I think, you know, I just I realized, you know, early on, I have to go to the very basics to reassure these people. Look, when I'm in the room, 
I, you know, it's not, you know, this is confidential. You know, when I leave the room, I can't hear you. I can't see you. You can have private conversations, um, you know, and, you know, just simple th things that seem very simple, but are actually very important. Yes, I agree. You know, I, I think something that Paul mentioned a little bit earlier, I actually think the virtual system has been um, enhanced the skill sets um, of the neutrals um, over what it did for the litigants, because it really makes the neutrals have to go through the ABCs of mediation, like pre-mediation telephone calls. You know, if so, you know, if, if, a, if a mediator got lazy, like, and maybe not made all their pre-mediation um, pre calls, they would you know, be able to get through it um, in, in, when it comes to the mediation. But it also makes it an, al almost makes it a necessity to, to go through that process with this system. And I think, you know, you, you get to catch some of the uh, issues earlier on than you, should you have not made those pre-mediation telephone calls. And that's just one small example. I, I feel like the neutrals are like having to be a little bit more on their toes and sharper and, you know, enhance their skill set a little bit. Uh, no doubt. Quite agree. Exactly. So um, anyway, um, we're kind of coming up um, towards the end of it. Uh, any closing remarks? Um, I mean, I've really enjoyed this conversation. So thank you both for being here, by the way. Look, I'm sure I speak for, for all of your neutrals when I say the staff here has done a remarkable job in um, adjusting. Um, just like we've talked about, everybody's had to do. I mean, they haven't missed a beat. And for that, I know um, I'm very thankful. And, um, you know, I'm thankful that you have given us the opportunity to do business in a manner that we're comfortable with. And I appreciate that. And, um, and I think, you know, um, I think it's been an exceptional job by ARM. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Our case managers have just done a phenomenal job of, of keeping us um, looking good, as I, as I say. Uh, a, a lot of the technical issues behind the scenes, they're handled very, very effectively. And, uh, and past that, I would just say that anybody who's watching this podcast or listening to this podcast going forward who have mediated with me, I thank you for your patience and those who will follow uh, your patience with us. But we're, we're, we're actually doing, we're doing pretty darn good, in, in my opinion. And this is coming from the guy that at the outset of this podcast said, you know, I had some real reservations and I expressed them to Abbas. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I echo your, your comments about the staff. They've been exemplary. I mean, we've come up with plans and they've executed them from the bottom to the top of the company and vice versa. Um, I really would commend them. I'm very proud of them. And, you know, I'm so happy that we have the personnel that we have on board. But also... I really want to thank you guys, the neutrals, for getting on board with the plan and, you know, being real team players. And it's taken a lot of teamwork. So thank you for that. And um, for the, for, I, I mean it, like, and, and, the, and the viewers um, and, the, and the listeners, um, we use the Blue Jean system. If you're unsure about the technology, feel free to call our case managers. They'll talk you through it. We also have a educational YouTube um, uh, kind of class on the Advanced Resolution Management YouTube website where you can watch it and it will talk you through how it works. But again, feel free to call and our staff will help you. In the interim, please stay safe, uh, please stay healthy and put your health above anything else. And uh, we wish you all the best from ARM. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Abbas.